Um, well, for you, those of you who don't know me, I'm Gabby. I'm one of the, just Gabby. No need for all the names. Um, I'm one of the leaders here at The Way. And um, if you don't know this about me, okay, so I work part-time for the church, and then I work part-time at a restaurant. And if you've ever worked at a restaurant, you know that that's where you grow impatience, right? Anyone? Thank you. <laughs> but also you get a bunch of stories, funny people or annoying people, whatever you want to call it. But I'll have a story today. So this one time, this lady walks into the restaurant, and she orders her food. She wants a burrito. So our burritos come with, like, a salad on top. So I take her food, and uh, she's like, excuse me, um, this is not what I ordered. And I was like, no, yeah, it's just the salad on top of the burritos right there. And she's like, no, there's no burrito here. It's just the salad and the rice. Like, there's nothing underneath. I was like, if you just get your fork and dig into it, the burrito's right there. And she's like, no, I just see salad. No, ma'am, it's like, it's right there. So she finally did it. She dug in and she found the burrito. Yay! <laughs> Another happy customer. But why do I say this? I'm not just ranting, guys. It has a point to it. We're in this series called OK Google, where we're asking hard faith questions and seeing what our Christianity is all about. Well, my question today is, why believe in something we can't see? Just like this lady couldn't see her burrito, sometimes we can't see God, or we think we can't see God. But today, I want to talk about the reality that it is that we do see God, and sometimes we just don't choose to see God. And so today, I'm going to talk about three ways that we clearly see God in our lives. And I'm going to call them exhibits, and exhibit A, we're going to call the Bible. So this book right here, it doesn't have to be pink. I just like it. But it's the Bible. And Bible, it's a Latin word, Biblia, which just means books. So if you don't know what the Bible is, let me tell you, it's so unique. It's the bestseller in the world. <clears throat> and year after year, since it was, you know, first existed, people have tried to disprove it, to destroy it, to cancel it, everything. But it's still here, and it's still the most published book in the world. And um, the Bible is made up of 66 different books. That's why it's called Biblia, books. Not only that, it has 40 different authors, authors from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of places. It was written in three different languages, three different continents, and it's been written over a lapse of 1,500 years. But you know what's so unique about it? It's that it has unity. It has the same message all throughout the book. Imagine 40 different authors with different points of views writing about the same story to all come together in this book we call the Bible. Like there's gotta be something bigger than just a human being writing words. So that's why we're gonna prove that, that Bible is where one of the places where we see God. And today I want to just give you some facts to prove that the Bible is trustworthy and it is reliable. So we're going to start about, um, if any you know, everyone, anyone knows what archaeology is. So archaeology has been called the Bible or Christianity's best friend. Why? Because people over and over again have said, well, the Bible is just a myth book. Like there are so many made up stories and um, this never happened, and that's, that could just never happen. Um, well, over and over again, and as the years progress, we find more and more proof that the Bible is true. For example, there's the, um, the, scroll, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the Old Testament. They found those scrolls in 1947. Those scrolls have survived over like 2,000 years prove that the Bible is true. Then they found the Pool of Siloam, which is this Jewish gathering that is mentioned in the book of John where Jesus gathered with the Jews. But then there's this big um, fictional character that some people called it. Um, if you grew up in church or not, maybe you've heard of David and Goliath, right? Well, people said that David was this fictional character. Um, it was just like King Arthur. You know, he'd never really uh, destroyed a giant and everything. But 
Um, a few years ago, they found archaeologists, BFFs, um, found proof in a stone that David was actually alive, and it said the years where he reigned over Israel. Again, proof that it is true. So over and over, we get proof, and people, you know, get bummed that they can't disprove and try and try and try. And all of all the books that they've tried to destroy, this one is still surviving, and it's thriving more than ever. 87% of people in the United States have a Bible in their home. Then, the biggest character where the Bible finds unity, it's Jesus. And over and over and over, people have said, well, Jesus wasn't real. Well, his resurrection wasn't real. Well, his death wasn't real. But then, archaeology comes and throws the punch and finds that crucifixion is actually true. They found skeletons that show the same signs that the Bible described. So guess what? Again, archaeology is catching up with the Bible and not the opposite. So we have scientific, historical, archaeological facts that the Bible is true. And then the story of Jesus is in the New Testament, right? And I want to see, uh, uh, let's see, how many of you have heard of Plato, Aristotle, um, Caesar? And they've been written into our history books. But do we have any idea how much proof we have of them? Let's see, Plato, his story was written a thousand years after his life. And we have seven copies that he existed. Aristotle, his life was written a thousand four hundred years after his life. We have 49 copies. It's better. But then we have the New Testament, the story of Jesus. That was written starting 20 to 100 years after his life. Do you have any idea how many copies we have? We have 5,600 of the originals. Way more than anything in our history books. Yet we try to disprove it. But over and over again, we see how real it is. And you might say, okay, it's real, but how do we know that it is the word of God? Well, since we know it's accurate, since we know it's reliable, we go into John 1.1, 1, 1, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we go into verse 14, and it says, The Word became flesh, and His dwelling among us. The Word is God. He's telling us. And in 2 Timothy, he's saying every scripture is the breath of God. It's his living scripture. So exhibit A, the Bible. We find everything he wants to say historically and the best way to live our life in the Bible. Now I want to go to exhibit B, creation. Yes, creation, everything around us. And for that, since we know the Bible is reliable, I want to go to Psalms 19.1. And it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Is anyone amazed? Like, who loves a sunset or a sunrise? Like, they're beautiful, right? Where I come from, we just have two seasons. Extremely hot summer or extremely hot rain. That's it. But here we have the beauty of living in four seasons. We see snow, we see the beautiful colors of the fall, we see the summer, the green, beautiful pasture, the mountain, we're in the mountain state. We see those beautiful architecture or structure design. Um, imagine this, you're walking in a field and all of a sudden you find a watch. Well, is your first thought gonna be, well, I guess this just happened. You know, this watch just came out of nowhere. Or would you grab that watch and see, oh, I wonder who its designer is. I wonder what it's made for. I wonder what its intent, its purpose can be. I think that would be our first reaction. So why not look at creation and see, it's so perfect. I wonder how the seasons change in a certain way. I wonder how everything just falls into place. 
Which brings me to the two logical arguments that atheists can't even fight. Um, the first one is the cosmological argument. This argument talks about the cost and effect. You know, every cause has an effect. Well, the logic thing here is that if we go to, with the cause all the way to eternity, it's impossible because then nothing would have cost it. Which brings us to the logic that there has to be something bigger and eternal that created that, for that cost to have an effect which argues that there has to be a God. The second argument is the teleological argument. Teleological comes from the word telos in Greek, which means purpose, goal. And this argument um, talks about the evidence of the harmony and order and everything in the design of the universe. This says that there is a purpose for everything. There is a purpose for every season. Everything works in harmony with each other, which, again, explains the being of something greater, of something eternal, something powerful. But then there's the biggest creation that no human has been able to, to um, crack, and that's you. That's your DNA. Each one of you has a unique DNA that no scientist has been able to do to know how we just reproduce something so unique. Again, explaining how there has to be something bigger. Um, in Romans, sorry, Romans 1.20, it says, For since the creation of the world's God's invisible qualities... His eternal power, divine nature, has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. It's all around us. There is no excuse that everything we see on a daily has a greater purpose, has a perfect creator, someone that's in eternity and outside of our time, we just have to want to see it. So exhibit, exhibit B, creation. And then it leads us to our final um, exhibit C, which is experience. And what I mean by that, it's the experience of your life, you as a human being. We just talked about God created you and created your DNA. But in Genesis 1.27, He says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We, you, are created in his image. And how do we know? How do we know that we are really created in his image? Well, I'll give you two, um, two factors. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, sorry. <laughs> he has made everything beautiful in its time. He also has set eternity in the human heart. So we're made in his image. Eternity. We're talking about an eternal God. Now, I want you to think of yourself. I want you to think if you've ever felt like there's got to be something more. There's got to be something eternal. What is that hole that I can't fulfill the more that I try? It can't just be 80, 40, 90 years. There's got to be more than that. Well, yes. You're feeling that because your God, your creator, your designer is eternal. And he has put that sense of eternity in your heart so that you're willing and you're wanting to spend eternity with him. That is his perfect design. 
So the sons of eternity were made in his image. Then we have Romans 2.15. And it talks about, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. The law is written on our hearts. Also, that is the sense of morality. Have you ever thought of why there's something in you that tells you when something is right or wrong? And where does that come from? There is a creator who is perfect, who is righteous, who implanted that sense of morality in you. No one had to tell you that killing was wrong. There is something in you that tells you, oh, it, it's wrong. I know right and wrong. The movies, heroes against bad and evil, and they're not Christian movies. They're just movies. <laughs> Yet there is something in us that tells us there's a higher morality, a good and evil that we know of. So the sense of morality, another aspect that we're made in the image of a God, of our God. And then I want you to think a minute and think about your life. Think about where you've been. Think about why you're here tonight. Think about all the little things that have happened throughout your life that you can't explain, but you've called it a coincidence. You've called it an accident, but yet have no explanation for. See, that was me. <laughs> I grew up in a Christian home. I went to church every Sunday, and I knew there was a God. But I still didn't accept that that God was the creator of everything, and I didn't want to accept that I wanted to live in the way he intended me to live. And I thought I couldn't see God. Like, that's just because, you know, my parents talk about it, they talk about it at church, but I can't see it. But guess what? When I decided I wanted to see God, he was everywhere. Every aspect of my life reflected him. Everything around me had his handprint. So I want to ask you tonight, instead of why believe something we can't see, I want to ask you, why not believe something you can see? Something you see every day, something you see in your daily life. The band can come up. <clears throat> and as you think about this, I want to challenge you this week to go about your week seeing God everywhere. Ask yourself where you can see God. It doesn't need to be a supernatural thing. I saw miracles. I saw a deaf person here again. Yet that didn't lead me to believe. It had to be me wanting to see the miracle that he was, the miracle that he is, and what he had done. So go about your week, seeing every aspect of your life, go on a walk, see creation, see that there's something more with a purpose behind everything that you see. See that there's a greater creator that made a perfect creation, including you. Ask yourself how you can see God this week. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for um, good weather. Thank you for the fire. Um, I just thank you for your perfect creation. Thank you for the things that we can't explain that lead us to know that there is a greater God that 
it has a purpose and has a plan and that it all works in unison for your glory. I pray for the hearts of every person here. I pray that you help them see that it's not an accident that they're here and that you do have a goal and a purpose for their lives, a greater meaning, an eternity that is with you. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.